Hello, my name is Michael, and I obsess. I come across something that grabs me, and I consume until I can't take any more, and then I'm on to the next. Some obsessions last a week, others a lifetime. It is my intention to explore these obsessions with you as they occur while the passion is hot. Welcome to Eclectic Obsessions. This film will take you where no one has ever been before. No eyewitness has actually seen what you are about to see. But in this world of ours where going to the moon will soon be upon us and where the most incredible things are happening all around us, someday, perhaps tomorrow, the fantastic events you are about to see can and will take place. That was the original on-screen prologue appearing immediately after the opening 20th Century Fox logo and fanfare. I never saw this movie in the theater, but it was a television staple of my childhood. We will be exploring Fantastic Voyage on this episode of Eclectic Obsessions. Fantastic Voyage is a 1966 American science fiction film directed by Richard Fleischer and written by Harry Kleiner, based on a story by Otto Clement and Jerome Bixby. The film is about a submarine crew who are shrunk to microscopic size and venture into the body of an injured scientist to repair damage to his brain. The original story took place in the 19th century and was meant to be a Jules Verne-style adventure with a sense of wonder. Kleiner abandoned all but the concept of miniaturization and added a Cold War element. The film starred Stephen Boyd, Raquel Welch, Edmund O'Brien, Donald Pleasance, and Arthur Kennedy. Bantam Books obtained the rights for a paperback novelization based on the screenplay and approached Isaac Asimov to write it. Because the novelization was released six months before the movie, many people mistakenly believed that the film was based on Asimov's book. The movie inspired an animated television series. The United States and Soviet Union have both developed technology that can miniaturize matter by shrinking individual atoms, but only for one hour. The novel stated that the duration of miniaturization is inversely proportional to its degree. A 50% reduction could be maintained for many days, but a reduction to microbial size could last for only an hour. Scientist Dr. Jan Bennis, played by Jean Duvall, working behind the Iron Curtain, has figured out how to make the process work indefinitely. With the help of American intelligence agents, including Agent Charles Grant, played by Stephen Boyd, he escapes to the West, but an attempted assassination leaves him comatose with a blood clot in his brain that no surgery can remove from the outside. To save his life, Agent Grant, pilot Captain Bill Owens, played by William Redfield, Dr. Michaels, played by Donald Pleasance, Surgeon Dr. Peter Duvall, played by Arthur Kennedy, and his assistant Cora Peterson, played by Raquel Welch, are placed aboard a Navy submarine at the Combined Miniature Deterrent Forces facilities. The submarine, named Proteus, is then miniaturized to about the size of a microbe and injected into Bennis. The team has 60 minutes to get to and remove the clot. After this, Proteus and its crew will begin to revert to their normal size, become vulnerable to Bennis's immune system, and, in the words of Asimov's novelization, kill Bennis regardless of the success of the surgery. The crew faces many obstacles during the mission. An arteriovenous fistula forces them to detour through the heart, where cardiac arrest must be induced, at the risk of killing Bennis. After an unexplained loss of oxygen, they must replenish their supply in the lungs. 
They are forced to pass through the inner ear, requiring all outside personnel to make no noise so as to prevent destructive shocks. A sound is accidentally made from a fallen surgical tool, though, and the ship and crew are badly thrown about, and Cora is, as a result, almost killed by antibodies. To top it all, they discover after their detour through the heart, the surgical laser that is needed to destroy the clot was damaged from the turbulence, and this was due to it not being strapped down as it was before. The crew confirms a saboteur is on the mission. They must cannibalize their wireless telegraph to repair the laser, making communication and guidance from outside impossible to get from then on. By the time they finally reach the clot, they have only six minutes remaining to operate and then exit the body. Before the mission, Grant had been briefed that Duval was the prime suspect as a potential surgical assassin. But as the mission progresses, he pieces the evidence together, and near the end, instead begins to suspect Michaels. During the critical phase of the operation, Dr. Michaels knocks out Owens and takes control of Proteus, while the rest of the crew is outside for the operation. Duval successfully removes the clot with the laser, but Michaels tries to crash the submarine into the clot area to kill Bennis. Grant fires the laser at the ship, causing it to veer away and crash. Grant saves Owens from the Proteus, but Michaels is trapped in the wreckage and killed when a white blood cell attacks and destroys the ship. The remaining crew swim desperately to one of Bennis' eyes and escape through a tear duct seconds before returning to normal size. The original screenplay included a follow-up scene, in which, because of brain damage caused by the submarine, Bennis no longer remembers the formula for unlimited miniaturization. Surviving still suggests that this scene was filmed, but never used. You are listening to the sound of a completely new screen experience. A startling new kind of excitement. As 20th Century Fox plunges you into the most incredible adventure that man could ever achieve. To make a motion picture that crosses a new frontier may seem impossible today. Outer space, the depths of the sea, the bowels of the earth, the past, the future, all have been subjects for the camera. But now, a film called Fantastic Voyage has broken through in an unexpected direction to create an adventure of astonishing suspense and beauty. One of the miracles of the universe. Its vital new story sweeps down from the sky. Then, it drops the bottom out of the world you know and understand. As a beleaguered nation desperate for survival launches a journey you can never erase from your memory. We need you for security purposes, Mr. Grant. They know they failed to kill Banish. Security thinks they'll try again, first chance they get. A woman has no place on a mission I of this insist kind. on taking my technician. You'll take along who I assign. Don't tell me who I'm going to work with. Four men and a beautiful girl, off on a fantastic voyage, actually entering inside the human body, exploring an unknown universe, unknown dangers. They're tightening. I can't breathe. 24 seconds left. After that, you're in danger of attack. Come on. It's sheer suicide for all of us. You are there with them, sharing a breakthrough in motion pictures. It's gone. If you thought it was too late to discover something entirely new on the screen, Fantastic Voyage will be a stunning experience. For you are going where no man or camera has ventured before. When you come out, you may never look at yourself in the same way again. Give 
me your widest beam. Full power. The film was the original idea of Otto Clement and Jerome Bixby. They sold it to Fox, which announced that the film would be the most expensive science fiction film ever made. Richard Fleischer was assigned to direct and Saul David to produce. Both men had worked at the studio before. Fleischer had originally studied medicine and human anatomy in college before choosing to be a movie director. Harry Kleiner was brought in to work on the script. The film starred Stephen Boyd, making his first Hollywood movie in five years. It was the first role at Fox for Raquel Welch, who was put under contract to the studio after being spotted in a beauty contest by David's wife. The budget was set at five million. The budget went up to six million, three million of which went on the sets and one million on test footage. For the technical and artistic elaboration of the subject, Fleischer asked for the collaboration of two people of the crew that he had worked with on the production of 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, the film he directed for Walt Disney in 1954. The designer of the Nautilus from the Jules Verne adaptation, Harper Goff, also designed the Proteus. The same technical advisor, Fred Zendar, collaborated on both productions. The Proteus, of course, they built a full-size Proteus in the film, and they used that to good effect because they not only built a full-size exterior, the interior was built as well. What's great about it is you could get shots outside of the Proteus looking in with your actors as well as shots inside the Proteus looking out. So usually you don't have a full-size exterior to shoot back into. The time spent in the movie of the crew once they were miniaturized is in real time, taking up exactly one hour of the movie. The scenes of crew members swimming outside the sub were shot on dry sound stages with the actors suspended from wires. There was some additional hazard involved because to avoid reflections from the metal, the wires were washed in acid to roughen them, which made them more likely to break. To create the impression of swimming in a resisting medium, the scenes were shot at 50% greater speed than normal, then played back at normal speed. Medical schools, at least as late as the 1980s, showed clips from this movie to illustrate various concepts in human anatomy, physiology, and especially immunology. The signature effect in the film, of course, are the point of views looking outside of the sub of being inside the body, the plasma of the blood, and, and how that was created. Those shots were made in large tanks, large glass tanks, uh, with water, and they basically cr found substances like Vaseline or castor oil or anything that was anything that wouldn't mix with water and they would eject this stuff out from the bottom of the tank and would float up toward the surface and then they would have a camera shooting straight down at it with a big wide angle lens so this material would come at you sort of like a lava lamp you know anything that wouldn't mix together you know oil oil and vinegar don't mix and that stuff comes at you those would then be elements that they would mat behind the sub or they would expose them many times over and over to sort of create this whole interior environment of cells and, and plasma moving around in the bloodstream. I never imagined it could be anything like this. I always thought it was nothing but red. I think the visual effects are quite, quite effective. I mean, there are some things that we could do today which would be easier as far as there are some technical uh, issues uh, with making a film back at that time. All those effect shots were created with what we today call traditional visual effects techniques. So everything that's in the film has to be photographed practically through some sort of mechanical method. Um, and today, of course, we have uh, computer graphic technology, so it's a lot easier to sort of uh, remove the technical flaws that they had to deal with. There are some scenes, for example, where you're inside the submarine looking out and it's shaking. She won't respond. We're in some sort of current. The background is kind of what we call scissoring strangely to the foreground because it's not tracked. Today on the computer we can track the background in to make it look like it all belongs together. That was a very difficult thing to do back then because they didn't have that technology. Although, you know, it's still very effective. This is the first American feature film with no musical score for the opening credits, only electronic pulses and sound effects. The score was composed and conducted by Leonard Rosenman. 
The composer deliberately wrote no music for the first four reels of the film, before the protagonists center the human body. Rosenman wrote that the harmony for the entire score is almost completely atonal, except for the very end where our heroes grow to normality. The film received mostly positive reviews and a few criticisms. The weekly entertainment trade magazine Variety gave the film a positive pre-release review, stating the lavish production, boasting some brilliant special effects and superior creative efforts, is an entertaining, enlightening excursion through inner space, the body of a man. Bosley Crowther of the New York Times wrote, For straight science fiction, this is quite a film, the most colorful and imaginative since Destination Moon. Richard Schickel of Life magazine wrote that the rewards would be plentiful to audiences who get over the real whopper of suspended disbelief required. He found that though the excellent special effects and sets could distract from the scenery's scientific purpose in the story, the old familiar music of science fiction in lush new arrangements was a true delight, and the seriousness with which screenwriter Kleiner and director Fleischer treated the story made it more believable and fun. Schickel made note of, but dismissed, other critics' allegations of camp. As of 2020, the film holds a 91% approval rating at the review aggregator website Rotten Tomatoes from 32 reviews, with the consensus being, the special effects may be a bit dated today, but Fantastic Voyage still holds up well as an imaginative journey into the human body. The film won Academy Awards for Best Art Direction and Best Special Effects and was nominated for Best Cinematography, Best Film Editing, and Best Sound Editing. After acquiring the film's paperback novelization rights, Bantam Books approached Isaac Asimov to write the novelization, offering him a flat sum of $5,000 with no royalties involved. In his autobiography, In Joy Still Felt, Asimov writes, I turned down the proposal out of hand. Hack work, I said, beneath my dignity. However, Bantam Books persisted, and at a meeting with Mark Jaffe and Marcia Nassiter on April 21, 1965, Asimov agreed to read the screenplay. In the novelization's introduction, Asimov states that he was reluctant to write the book because he believed that the miniaturization of matter was physically impossible but he decided that it was still good fodder for storytelling and that it could make for some intelligent reading. In addition, 20th Century Fox was known to want someone with some science fiction clout to help to promote the film. Aside from the initial impossibility of the shrinking machine, Asimov went to great lengths to portray with great accuracy what it would actually be like to be reduced to infinitesimal scale. He discussed the ability of the lights on the sub to penetrate normal matter, issues of time distortion, and other side effects that the movie does not address. Asimov was also bothered by the way the wreck of the Proteus was left in Venice. In a subsequent meeting with Jaffe, he insisted that he would have to change the ending so that the submarine was brought out. Asimov also felt the need to gain permission from his usual science fiction publisher, Doubleday, to write the novel. Doubleday did not object, and had suggested his name to Bantam in the first place. Asimov began work on the novel on May 31st, and completed it on July 23rd. In the film, the crew, apart from the saboteur, managed to leave Bennis's body safely before reverting to normal size, but the Proteus remains inside, as do the remains of the saboteur's body, albeit digested by a white blood cell, and several gallons full scale of a carrier solution, presumably saline, used in the injection syringe. Isaac Asimov pointed out that this was a serious logical flaw in the plot, since the submarine, even if reduced to bits of debris, would also revert to normal size, killing Venice in the process. Therefore, in his novelization, Asimov had the crew provoke the white cell into following them, so that it drags the submarine to the tear duct and its wreckage expands outside Venice's body. Asimov solved the problem of the syringe fluid by having the staff inject only a very small amount of miniaturized fluid into Bennis, minimizing its effect on him when it expands. 
Fantastic Voyage 2 Destination Brain was written by Isaac Asimov in 1987 as an attempt to develop and present his own story apart from the 1966 screenplay. This novel is not a sequel to the original, but instead is a separate story taking place in the Soviet Union with an entirely different set of characters. The novel was not made into a movie. James Cameron was interested in directing a remake, but decided to devote his efforts to his Avatar project. He still remained open to the idea of producing a feature based on his own screenplay, and in 2007, 20th Century Fox announced that pre-production on the project was finally underway. Roland Emmerich agreed to direct, but rejected the script written by Cameron. Marianne and Cormac Wiberly were hired to write a new script, but the 2007-2008 Writers Guild of America strike delayed filming, and Emmerich began working on 2012 instead. In spring 2010, Paul Greengrass was considering directing the remake from a script written by Shane Salerno and produced by James Cameron, but later dropped out to be replaced by Sean Levy. It was intended that the film be shot in native stereoscopic 3D. In January 2016, The Hollywood Reporter reported that Guillermo del Toro was in talks to direct the reboot by reteaming with David S. Goyer, who was writing the film's script with Justin Rhodes, with Cameron still on the film by his production company, Lightstorm Entertainment. In August 2017, it was reported that Del Toro had postponed working on the film to completely focus on his film, The Shape of Water, due to release the same year, and he would start pre-production in spring 2018 and would begin filming in the fall of the same year for a 2020 release. Nostalgia aside, this is still a very enjoyable film. Although dated, the effects are still quite impressive, and the story is compelling enough to hold your attention. I can't put nostalgia aside, however. I grew up with this playing constantly on TV and bought it on Blu-ray as an adult. I have been obsessed with it for years. Thank you for listening to Eclectic Obsessions. If you like what you've heard, please download past episodes and subscribe on iTunes for future releases. You can follow the show on Facebook at Eclectic Obsessions, on Twitter at Eclectic Obsess One, on Instagram at Eclectic Obsessions Podcast, and on YouTube at Eclectic Obsessions. I'd love to hear what you think. Feel free to email the show at ecobpod at gmail.com. We'll be back in one month's time with a new eclectic obsession. <laughs> <laughs>